the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And dear brothers and sisters, once again we have come through the season of preparation, and we now lie upon the threshold of entry into the great and holy fast. And if we think back over the past four Sundays, we have set before us the model of what our journey towards and through Lent should be. We have the eagerness of Zacchaeus to greet his Lord, his willingness to forego his past life, to turn away from his deeds which were not salutary and to turn towards God. We have, of course, the lesson of the publican and the Pharisee and the example set before us of how great heartfelt prayer can be, how great the spirit of repentance, how great the spirit of submission before God. We have in the parable of the prodigal son the recognition that sin estranges us from God and that it is only by turning away from this sin and turning back towards our Heavenly Father that we can be reunited with him. We have, of course, last week the understanding that set before us ultimately will be the day of judgment and that on this day God will judge each of us according to the merits of those things which we have done in this life, whether we have been God-pleasing towards him or not. Today, as we prepare to enter into the fast, we have set before us what is most commonly known as Cheese Fair Sunday, but which the, which the Lenten Triodian terms the casting out the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise. We all, of course, know this story from the book of Genesis, that Adam and Eve were given to take care of the garden, and they were given but one commandment by God, and that this commandment, for reasons unknown to us, became too onerous for them to bear. We know that they submitted to the advice of the serpent in the garden, and that as a result of this submission, but even more to the point, as the result of their refusal to take responsibility for their actions when asked by God, they were cast out from the garden. We've heard these past several Saturday evenings at Vigil, the beautiful lament by the waters of Babylon. And this is a lament, of course, that comes from the Psalms and that expresses the sorrow that the Israelite nation felt at being cast out from their homeland and being found to be in bondage to those around them. They lamented over the loss of that which God had given to them. And so, dear brothers and sisters, it should be for us as we look forward to the entering of Great and Holy Lent. There are two themes from the Gospel reading for today. The first is that a truly spiritual life is not possible without fasting. It is only in fasting that we turn away from those things which keep us tied to the earth. And we know from the teachings of the Church that it is only by turning towards the Heavenly Father and thus having turned away from these things that we can inherit the Kingdom. And so we're given fasting not as an option, but we're giving fasting as a commandment, as an enjoyment to us, as a discipline that we are to undertake. Unfortunately for many of us, fasting is something that we consider to be a burden. It's something that we consider to be a duty. It's something that if we do it at all, we can check it off of the list and we can say before God that I've done my duty. But this is not true fasting. True fasting is the understanding that in giving up something lesser, we inherit from God something incomparably greater. By giving up our attachment to the things of the world, we gain instead a foothold in the heavenly kingdom. And so as we prepare to enter into the great and holy fast, let us consider not whether we will fast, but how best we might undertake a God-pleasing and salvific fast. The second theme from today's Gospel reading is that of forgiveness. And we know, dear brothers and sisters, that without forgiveness there is no entry into the Kingdom. We are told in no uncertain terms in today's Gospel that as we forgive one another our trespasses, so God will forgive our trespasses. If we look at this Gospel reading, we see that there are no conditions attached to this. Our entry into heaven is not predicated upon whether or not the other person forgives us. 
It is not predicated upon anything other than us unconditionally forgiving one another. Because this is the forgiveness that God extends to us. Were we to be held accountable for each and every evil that we have done, there would be no forgiveness possible. But God sets aside our many sins. He sets aside our many transgressions. And if he can do this, if Christ, who became flesh, can set aside the transgressions of those who mocked him, who spat upon him as he walked the road to Golgotha, as he was nailed to the cross, as he was left to die a horrible death, if our Lord and God and Savior can forgive these people, surely we can find it within our hearts to forgive those who have committed much less wrongs against us. Many people question why it is that we ask forgiveness of one another, whether we have given offense or not. We do this for many reasons, dear brothers and sisters. We ask forgiveness because we don't know within our hearts whether we have given offense to somebody else. But we also ask, offend, forgive me, we ask forgiveness of everybody because we bear responsibility for our neighbor, both his virtues and his sins. To the extent that we strive to live a God-pleasing life, to the extent that we seek to turn away our eyes from the sins of our neighbor and to only see their virtues, to the extent that we lift one another up in prayer and fasting and almsgiving, to the extent that we manifest Christ's love to the least of our brethren or to the greatest of our enemies, to this extent we have helped our brother or sister to bear his or her burdens. And we ask forgiveness for having not done this in our lives. It's not enough for us to say, I haven't sinned against him or her, and therefore there is no need for me to ask forgiveness. But we must plumb the depths of our hearts. We must ask ourselves, have I sinned against my neighbor by indifference, by walking by them as they stood by the side of the road and asked alms, by saying that I was too busy to help my friend or my family member who was in need, by turning a blind eye to the plight of my sister or brother when they have need of me. <coughs> God tells us in his Gospels that as you have done unto your brother who was hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison, so have you done unto me. And this is the lesson that we should take with us as we prepare to embark upon the great and holy fast, that the plight of our neighbor is truly our plight as well. And to the extent that we set aside our own desires for comfort or pleasure or ease or rest or whatever the case may be, to the extent that we set this aside on behalf of our neighbor who is in need, to that extent, we shall be saved. We have to understand, dear brothers and sisters, that fasting, that the entry into and the journey through Lent is not a single act. It is a communal act. It is something that we undertake as the corporate body of Christ. And for all these reasons, we seek, before we enter into the fast, to be reconciled to our neighbor. Because ultimately, we cannot enter into heaven if there is not unity. Love presupposes unity. Love presupposes communion with our neighbor. And it presupposes unity not just with the neighbor whom we like, but it presupposes unity with even the person whose character we find to be the most odious, because this person is also our brother or sister in Christ. The hymns that we will hear tonight at the Vespers of Forgiveness enjoin us to enter into the season of the fast with joy. We are not to put on sackcloth and ashes, because this is not a time merely for sorrow. We do, of course, feel sorrow, both for our sins and for those things that we know about the life of our Creator, our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ. And that sorrow does deepen. It does intensify as we progress through Lent. <coughs> but that sorrow, that compunction, should be tempered by the joy of knowing that at the end of this journey, at the end of this road, lies the resurrected Christ. And through his resurrection, at the end of this journey, lies our salvation, if we but reach out and grab it as well, by God's grace. May we joyfully prepare to enter into the fast. May we joyfully prepare to embark upon the life-giving season of repentance. May we look at the example of those whom the Church has set before us, 
May we look to one another. May we spend this fast in seeing to the salvation of our neighbor. One of the reasons why we fast is so that we might give from that which we no longer use during the season, that we might take this and that we might use it on behalf of somebody else whose needs are greater than ours. May we do this this season. May we reach out to our brother or sister in need and take them by the hand and bring them along with us on the journey. May God grant us all a salvific and pleasing journey through the fast. May he grant us truly to, as did the publican, lament and beat our breasts and pray, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, that having embraced the fullness of repentance, we might embrace the fullness of the paschal joy. May God grant us all a blessed and profitable season of the fast, and may he bestow upon us all his great mercy. Amen. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen.